I'm Jay Kingley, co-founder and CEO of Maven, your host of Fractionals Unplugged. I'm joined today by Omed Sadati, a fractional chief product officer who assists pre-seed and seed stage B2B technology startups with their business and product strategy. He works with executive teams to identify key assumptions about product markets and business models and de-risk them as they explore product market fit. Omid is based in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. Welcome, Omid. Thank, Thank you so, you so much, much, Ed. Such, Such a nice, a nice introduction. introduction. I couldn't, I couldn't do, do that, that myself. myself. Welcome to Fractionals Unplugged, a podcast from Maven. You left the corporate world to build your own fractional executive business. By infusing your intellectual property into all aspects of your revenue generation, Maven enables you to earn in excess of $500,000 per year and more as you scale. Imagine a pipeline so full that prospects who value what you do will be the ones knocking on your door. Jay Kingley, the CEO of Maven and his guests share their insight on how you can get out of struggle city and into success city and beyond. Enjoy today's episode. I'm the CEO of a B2B SaaS company that has raised a friends and family round. My next milestone is my seed funding from professional investors. Now we bump into each other for the first time at an entrepreneur's meetup in San Francisco, one of like a thousand they have every week there. Now you've got a maximum of 60 seconds to give me your elevator pitch. Yeah, yeah sounds, sounds good. So, so I mean, so, so you, you must, must be excited, excited and passionate, passionate about an idea. idea. And most, most likely, likely you have multiple, multiple reasons. reasons. Maybe, Maybe you want to make an impact. Maybe, Maybe you want to become a billionaire. billionaire. Maybe all of that. And uh, there's, there's a lot, lot of noise out there, there. and a lot of opinion. opinion. And obviously, obviously we're going to talk to investors, to this, this and that, and everybody is looking into their success. success. Obviously, obviously your success, success, but also what they want. I am here to help you navigate and make sure you build a business that has the best foundation for decades to exist. And it also suits your lifestyle and what you want to accomplish. There is, I think, when you are starting this journey, it could be a 10 year, a decade journey to become a founder with a lot of ups and downs. And you really need to internalize and think about what do I want to get out of and how much I'm going to sacrifice. And what happens if my plan doesn't work out? Um, people, people may not, not tell you, you and you may not have done soul searching. My, my first job is to guide you based on my experience, experience how you navigate that and what you want to get out of it and have the real awareness of what you're getting into and all the ramifications of it. And then the second part is the technical part where like, okay, how do I have evidence that there is a product market fit? where you, you can, can go and say there is somebody wanting what I build and maybe is willing to pay at some point, if not yet. So I want to come back to product market fit in a moment. But first, in marketing, we have this great abbreviation we love to throw around called ICP. Now, technically, it stands for your ideal client profile. I always think about it as if your target market is a dartboard, your ICPs are the bullseye. So talk about your ICPs, and what is it that you look for when you meet them to decide who you want to spend your time and effort with? Good, Good question. question. So, so my ICPs are individuals, individuals who are deep expertise in some domain. domain. It, it could, could be doctors, doctors surgeons, surgeons, it could be lawyers, it could be technologists that graduated from a school with master's and PhD, and you know, these days, obviously, AI is is a hot topic but you know they've, 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 they've had this domain knowledge but they not necessarily know much about how to go and build a business around that so they are always like differentiate between the concept of inventors and innovators there's there's many many inventors who come up with really novel ideas and they can patent it but they don't know how to make an, an innovation where like Hundreds of millions, if not billions, people will use that day to day. It's two different skill sets. So how do you work with this extremely intelligent, smart, subject matter expert and bring that innovation, that, that invention and make it into innovation? 
that is the people I look into and uh, would like to work. With. So I want to go back to something that you talked about, which is product market fit. Now, when you talk about early stage companies, that's going to be the pre-seed seed going into series A. The thing that you hear all the time, product market fit, PMF, got to nail it. Well, let's start by me asking you, what does product market fit mean? Great question. I think I actually haven't found in the industry like full alignment of what it means. Um, they're like just investors. I was talking to a while back and as I was working with one of my customers and they're like, come back when you have PMF. And this was like for pre-seed. And I'm like, PMF at pre-seed? What do you mean? And they said, well, if you have like three customers or more. So, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's how they, they define PMF. Right? But I think, I think it comes back, uh, one of the best framework I've, um, I've seen is the book by Jeffrey Moore, Crossing the Chasm, where it kind of describes how you build a product and then you have the people that are advocate and early adopters and it goes to the majority and the late majority and whatnot. That talks about the life cycle of that. But it, it could mean different things. If you look at a company and you project, you know, the next 10 years you want to have billions of dollars of revenue, you want to have, uh, if it be to be thousands of customers, hundreds of thousands of customers, uh, but at every stage is different. Like the stage that I am um, usually pre seed to see is like validate there is enough interest and enough interest again depends on the company. You're going after large cap or mid cap or, or what, but could be like anywhere from you get five really large customers to maybe 20 mid cap and medium sized customers. And there is that much demand, and then you can actually get from zero to one, meaning that you sign up a few customers, and they're willing to pay, and they use the product, and they rave about you. That is the first step. Now, from there on, obviously, once you get the seed, it's like, okay, how do I get to certain A? And that's, again, another, like, you need to get to hundreds of customers. So you kind of change the definition of product market fit, and that's the whole art and science of how do I look at the different segments of market and different products and keep on expanding and building this? One of the things that I believe that you need to demonstrate to show PMF, even across the stages that you're talking about, is that your customers cannot live without your product or service. And if you can show that, then you have decent prospects for being able to have an increasingly scalable customer acquisition strategy as the funding comes in and as you go from stage to stage. But if they may like your product, but if they can live without it, then I think most investors would say, you you haven't really got it. Yeah, and I think what I'm glad you mentioned that where it gets really tricky is like, making sure you also don't over pivot on that because it's very easy to like find a large customer and build something cost for them and they love it but except like nobody else wants that because it's so custom and so it's not a scale you can't just turn it in and give it to another hundred customers or you might even go after a market where like you say oh i have hundred customers but maybe it's just too niche and there's only hundred customers and there is no way for you with that product to get to a thousand. And again, it all comes down to the first point I mentioned about finding your game as an entrepreneur. It's like somebody might come and say, you know what, I'm totally fine with this business. It could be a lifestyle business. It could generate you know, a few million dollars for me per year. And I don't need to go to a VC. I'm totally cool with that. The other entrepreneur says, I want to build a unicorn. This has to become a billion dollar business. Well, well, if, if that's, that's your definition, definition or your aspiration, aspiration then you might think about, think about your product, product market being very different the way, way the VCs expect, expect you to be. Excellent point. Now, if I think about the number of consultants, advisors, self-declared experts, talking heads, and the volume of information that they will put out on PMF, you think that this issue is a huge issue for the ICPs that you focus on. So why do they struggle so much to nail their product market fit? 
I think it's just, just kind of what, what you mentioned, mentioned because, because I, I, in a way, I think it's fascinating that we've all been like trained to look at all these different, different frameworks. And, and guess what? what? Like, like there is at least a new framework I see on LinkedIn, LinkedIn that somebody puts, this is how you do demand marketing. marketing. This, this is how you do PMF. This is how you go about MVP. And and we have forgotten that at the end of it, these frameworks first have been created by people like us. With the, the same, same intelligence. intelligence. I, I could create, create a framework. framework. You, you could do. All of us could do. Um, and, and at, at, at the, the end, end of the day, it's about critical thinking and a strategic thinking and, and really understanding and internalizing the context that you operate, whether it's an industry, the dynamic of the industry, the stakeholders, the regulation, the macroeconomy, the microeconomy, you know, political environment, geopolitical, everything. And without that, and without, and without those critical, critical thinking lens, there's, there's just a bunch of frameworks, frameworks that you can apply. And, and the danger of those frameworks is you apply and because it works on paper, you think, oh, okay, I know the business. This, this is, is going to work. work. I'm going to have product market fit. This, this is going to sell that much because I use this framework that is in this book. book. And I'm really? like, yeah, yeah but, but not, not really, really because, because you probably don't have the depth of knowledge. And, you know, I had this former boss at Meta he is an um, executive VP there is still, um, great mentor of mine. He told me a sentence I still remember. He said, when I do business, I do it as I play chess. I look at all the permutation of the game. That's what it really takes. Because the world is unknown, there's a lot of things happening. And unless you play the chess with all the permutation and you have a plan, no framework is gonna help you because it's not gonna be linear from I get from point A to point B like that. It's, it's going to be a zigzag of who knows, up and down and this and that. And you have to prepare for that. And no framework can teach you that, in my mind. Now, most early stage companies know they have to tick the product market fit. So clearly, they're thinking about it. They're doing things uh, to try to demonstrate that. And yet, most of the things that they're doing aren't working. So. First, take us through what are the things that you see that these early stage companies are trying to do to get product market fit? And why don't these things typically work for them? Great, Great question. question. I, I think, think one thing about being a founder is to perpetually feel comfortable being uncomfortable, meaning you need to be ready to grow and learn and do things that you may feel very uncomfortable. And um, I mean, the danger is that the founder will shy away from that and start going to their comfort zone. So in case of, for example, technical founder is that um, I'm not a salesperson, so I'm gonna stick with building a product. I know how to design a system, a cloud system and do and do this, so I'm gonna spend three months to do that without talking to a customer or at least enough customer, right? Um, that, that could be detrimental right? because you spend, spend money, you spend, spend time, time, and you're gonna you have, have you're making, making probably wrong assumptions, assumptions about what customer wants. Um, a lot of things in product market fit fails because there is this inherent assumption that you're making about what people want and need and how they're gonna use the product. Is it gonna be a mobile app? Is it gonna be a desktop app? Is it gonna be cloud based? Is the security matter? The privacy matters or not? And uh, 100 people use it is collaboratively or one person individually use it. And like without knowing all this detail, if you make this assumption, it is very scary because you're probably building something that is not what the market wants. And so maybe going back to your question and summarizing it, it's just like making sure you look at all the aspects. And if you're a technical founder, challenge yourself to talk to a customer, one, one customer a day. I had this founder, and you know, I, I told him, you know, I found somebody on LinkedIn and told her, you know, this person might be interested to talk to because they have something to say. And she's like, well, I don't know them directly. I'm like, that's the whole point. You're going to connect with them. I know you're uncomfortable. Do you really want to do this business or not? If that mission is too, that big for you and important, you got to do a stuff that you haven't done in your life. <laughs> So do you think, Omid, that talking to customers is really at the root cause of this, that all these 
issues, the things that these companies are trying that aren't working around demonstrating product market fit are all at the root cause because they're not engaging enough with the right customers and the right hundred percent. Hundred percent. I cannot emphasize that. Is what as an entrepreneur we will do is to find a meaningful problem and solve it meaningfully, right? Problem is all about people. Without people on planet Earth, there would have been no problems right now. We have created and we have experienced this this problem. And, and we, we have, have this feeling about our problems, our challenges. And, and so it's, it's a game, a game of, psychology, of psychology, it's a game, game of anthropology. anthropology. I think I that's, that's why, why like, I'm, I'm always, always I, as much as I enjoy all this, because, because I also have technical background, background, so I enjoy working with technical people. But, but I found I people who come from these majors like philosophy or anthropology or social sciences, they're so good at this game because like they know people, they know what drives them, what motivates them. What, what they don't, they don't like. like. And, and at, at the, the end, end of it, when we talk about product market fit, is that gut feeling. People, people don't necessarily, necessarily buy your product. product. People, people buy your, your vision. vision. Think, Think about, about Apple. Apple. We, buy we buy Apple, Apple because, because we respect the brand and the innovation and the creativity. And we don't buy the laptop. Many, Many companies, companies create, create laptops laptop and phones. Right? And, and this, this is actually, actually I'm, I'm borrowing this from a uh, talk from Simon Sinek, the, the golden uh, golden circle framework. It's, it's about, about like you understanding people, understanding what drives them, them. And, and you show them, them that, that at the gut level, level, at the feeling that this is what we're doing. And this is just a manifestation, just product that you buy. It's not the end goal. This, this is, is just, just a simple, simple manifestation, manifestation, the first, the first step. step. But you're you buying that vision, that vision from me. me. And, we and we align, align on that vision. vision. We, we want to get, get there. there. That's, That's the future, future we want to have. And, and the other thing I would say about Simon Sinek's golden circle uh, that I disagree with, but I, I don't think it's inconsistent with what you're saying. I don't think any customers do business with you because of your why. I think they do business with you because of their why. And they have something that's important and they have something that they want to accomplish. And the question is, do you understand them? And can you make a meaningful contribution changing what it is that they want to change to transform what it is that uh, they want to, to transform? I, I, I read something uh, literally a few days ago that uh, really caused me to open my eyes. And they were hearkening back, if you remember, to the uh, presidential uh, election in 2016. And they were talking about uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, I'm with her slogan. And they posited, how would it have been different if instead of saying I'm with her, it was she's with us. And that perspective of who is at the center is, I think, critical. And these companies, the successful ones, are the ones that enable their customers to achieve what it is that they want to achieve. Those customers don't exist to make that early stage company successful. But too often we, I think, lose our focus about what's important here. And I think that absolutely reinforces what it is that you're saying. So let me ask you this. So let's say that these early stage companies buy into, as they should, this importance of engaging with the right customers and they ask the right questions. Now what? So walk us through the steps that they need to take now that they have that basic data to get them out of what I like to call their struggle city into their success city. Uh, I think first, like, like collecting, collecting that, that feedback itself is, is, is an art and science where like, there is certain data points, points uh, you, you need to be collecting. Um, there's a framework called a SIN. I, I really enjoy I was introduced to it uh, myself recently, and um, I, I found it very, very uh, meaningful. Where uh, you, you need to understand a bit of the situation of that ICP that you're talking to, like what type of company it is, how big the team is, what's the dynamic, who they report to, what motivates them um, in terms of you know getting promotion or something, what they don't like, and all that. And then, uh, so, so without, without going, going too much into that, that framework, framework, it's like the collecting the data, data in, in a structural way is important. 
Um, you need to understand, you know, what are their top challenges. That's really important. And whether what you have in mind is priority number one or two. If it's not, it's priority number three and four, then you don't have most likely a chance in B2B because everybody does the first one or two things. Um, you obviously don't want to sell at that stage. So it's not about, to your point, it's about me and I have this and you're going to love it. It's about, forget about what I have. What? How, How can, can I serve, I serve you? you? If, if the, the world was, was different, different, if you have a magic, magic wand, wand, what would it be? And why? And what, and what would you want it to be different? different? Learn, Learn about, about that. that. And, and then, then huddle, huddle with you, all your, your smart team, team which, which all, all of you are, because you're founders, founders and, and, and figure out what would the product look like. Now there is this framework called design thinking, for example, that was really hot now. It is not without again talking too much about framework. It's like you need to take that and then brainstorm and come up with a few product ideas, maybe two or three alternatives. And then without really spending time on building that, go back with a few mock-ups and talk to the customer who was interested and say, does any of this work? or not, not. And, and why is that? that? What would you change? change? Oh, the, oh, the button, button should be here, here. The, the page should be here. here. I, need I need to share, share that with somebody. somebody. Work, Work on, on that, that mock-up. And then, and then once, once you have it, it try, try to put it together, together. With, with minimum, minimum engineering. engineering. So again, so again you know, don't, don't, don't don't think about the scale at this point. Don't think about I have tens of thousands of customers, I need this expensive cloud architecture. No, spend your energy. It's all about validation at this point. And, and do you think the, the idea, idea, which is, which are the assumptions, assumptions I'm making the right, the right assumptions, assumptions or not? And, and these are things, are things that you can usually validate within a week, week or month. month. It, doesn't it doesn't require six months month of investment. investment. And, so and so build, build it together, together using, using existing, existing technology, technology, maybe a mock-up, and, and let them play with it. And then monitor the engagement and usage. And through that, you learn so much. To the to point the that hopefully, hopefully you can secure a few contracts. Contract. Great advice. All early stage companies should pay attention, execute what Omid is telling you to do. Now we're going to take a quick break and when we come back, we're going to learn a bit about Omid. You've spent over 20 years in corporate and now you've stepped off the hamster wheel to run your own show as a fractional executive. Whether you're flying solo, leading a small firm or running a boutique, Maven is your fast track to earning over $500,000 annually, and potentially more, without the grueling corporate hours. This is your shot at the freedom, flexibility, and independence you've worked so hard to achieve. By infusing your intellectual property into all aspects of your revenue generation, Maven transcends the limitations of other sales and marketing approaches. You'll have a pipeline so full that prospects who truly value what you bring to the table will be the ones knocking on your door. You'll work directly with Jay and Taz, who've led the way for over 30 years, helping countless executives make this leap. Contact j.kingley at fractionalmaven.com. Spots are limited, so act now to build the business and life you deserve. Welcome back. We're talking to Omed Sadati, a fractional chief product officer who works with pre-seed and seed stage B2B tech startups, on product market fit and related issues. Omid, let's find out a bit more about you. Let me start with what were the transformative experiences in your career that enabled you to develop these insights that you have and that, frankly, a lot of your competitors don't? Uh, I feel, I feel like, like extremely, extremely fortunate, fortunate and um, grateful, grateful that, uh, so, so I moved here to Bay Area, Bay Area. I, I, uh, when, when I came, I came to, to US, US, I was I in Utah, Salt Lake City. City. Great, Great place. place. I went to the University, University of Utah, Utah but, at but at some point in 2006, I decided to come to Silicon Valley. Valley. And, and I think that was the pivotal moment, moment and milestone for me. And I got lucky. Maybe, maybe I had some talent. talent. I, I made it to Big Tech. Tech. I, I was at Google 2010. 2010. Um, um, left shortly because I was excited to do my first startup. And then that didn't quite work out. Although, Although I learned, I learned a, lot, a lot, but then I ended up at Meta at the time, uh, Facebook, of course, in 2011. And just, just really, really feel fortunate. fortunate. I, I, I saw uh, extremely smart, smart intelligent, intelligent, thoughtful, thoughtful people, people building products, products from, from zero to one, one strategizing, strategizing, drafting, drafting strategy, strategy, and 
just, just keep, keep thinking, thinking which, which you wouldn't, I think, like, I, I wouldn't have, have, have seen that. that. And I think, that, I think that's, that's how, how I actually, actually learned how to think about business, business and, and how to draft a strategy and, and, and build a thesis statement, statement about what happened. happened. Um, um, just being, being in this company's first hand and, and seeing it being done, done. Um, obviously, obviously Meta, Meta is a great, great company. company, we had Q&A uh, with Zog every week and, and just, he was so open about talking about what's happening, which was, um, you wouldn't normally see from leaders, right, at that level. And so, yeah, that, that I think totally changed me. So what happened in your life, either personally or professionally, that most explains why you're doing what you do today? Uh, that's a great question. I feel like I have a very, I, mean, I don't yeah, want to say necessarily, necessarily very unique, unique but, but, but obviously not, not like a cliche life, life because, because I, well, I'm, I'm originally from Iran, from Iran um, um, and uh, I, I was uh, little, little when, when the revolution happened in Iran, and, and as being, being part of a uh, member of a Baha'i faith, faith, I, um, you know, we were under a lot of like discrimination and persecution and all that stuff. So I, in a way, like I didn't have a very like, yeah, normal life, I would say. Uh, so, uh, so I think, I think that, that has shaped, shaped some of the experiences because, because of the circumstances, circumstances that I have been under. Like, um, um, I think I've developed a certain, certain level of resilience, resilience around, around risk taking and, and doing the stuff that, that many, many people, people would think that's just too much. much. I, I, I don't I want, want to live a life like that. But for me, it's like, this is not too much. This is just like normal life for me. So I think part of it is that, and I'm grateful for that. So really like, they say, they say what, what didn't break you or didn't, didn't kill you makes you stronger. Right? And then evidence of survived a lot of things and made it to the US as a refugee. And, and I'm stronger, stronger because of that experience. That experience. Uh, part, of part of it, I think, is my personality. personality. I've always, always had a keen interest, interest um, or keen sense, sense of curiosity. curiosity. And, and um, I also, I also like, like refuse to be categorized, categorized by, by, by this or that. that. Like, like I always, my, my first degree was a structural, structural engineer, but, but I didn't, didn't limit, limit myself, myself that I'm gonna stay that. When, when I came to US, US I actually studied computer, computer science, science. But, but again, I didn't, I didn't restrict, restrict that I'm gonna be software engineer. engineer. I, I actually, actually got, got a degree, degree from Carnegie Mellon also as an entrepreneurship. And you know, Dream to be an entrepreneur. I, I became a product leader and now I work with startups. So it's like, I play also music, classical piano and some non-classical. So I could have probably made a career out of that instead of tech. Um, I still made, who knows. Um, I, I refuse to be categorized by something and whenever my sense of curiosity takes me, I'll take it. So part of it, I think, is, is that journey of, a personal journey of, I will go where my heart says. I should, I should go. go. <laughs> well, through adversity, we build strength. And I think that is your story. So what's next for you over the coming 12 months? Um, yeah, um, yeah, so, so fractional, fractional work, I'm still involved and I have a good network of other fractional um, CXOs, if you will, that, you know, each other and, you know, we help our uh, customers and whatnot. I do, I do teach part-time part as an adjunct professor at Carnegie Mellon in Silicon, Silicon Valley campus, campus uh, for their for master's the program. program. And, and I, I'm, I'm working, working on a spill project, project, which uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's not, not ready, ready to share, share but uh, maybe at some point I'll share more about it. So what's the best way for those who are interested in our audience to contact you? I'm very I'm active, active on, on, on LinkedIn, LinkedIn so, so hit me up on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. You can, you can search, search me by my first and last, last name. And uh, uh, always welcome, welcome talking to... to Everybody, I also have a link of make an appointment there if you go to my profile link here so you can direct me with me. I'm happy to chat and connect. Well, we'll put that URL in our show notes. Make it easy for everybody to reach out and have a conversation. I will tell you from my own personal experience, that is a conversation that is a tremendous use of your time. Very high. Our Omid, I want to thank you for being a guest on our Fractionals Unplugged show. Now be sure to subscribe to both our podcast on all the major platforms and our YouTube channel for our videos. Until next time, make an impact on your clients and family on your terms, securing your independence with the freedom, flexibility, and control that you've earned.